So we are online. Hello, everybody. My name is Alena Sakolnikova. I'm an independent curator and researcher specializing in Russian design history. And I'm happy to welcome you on the YouTube channel of the All Russia Decorative Arts Museum, where I created the last exhibition, Vesh, the Token Objects. And today I'm honored to introduce to you our guest speaker, Lev Manovich. Uh, he's a leading uh, specialist in uh, theory of digital culture, author of over 14 books, uh, including the famous language of the new media and um, latest title cultural analytics that I also <laughs> have on my background in here. And he also shares a great interest in uh, Russian visual culture. So Lev, I'm very honored to have you here today. Well, thank you so much, Alona, for finding time in your busy schedule to do it. Uh, it was lots of fun to prepare it for you because you are, you know, wear many hats or many scarves. You are a design professor, practicing designer, curator, historian. And I just want to, before we start, just want to say literally a few words why uh, what we'll talk about you know, can be relevant and interesting to our listeners. So maybe some of you are designers, web designers, UX designers, some of you technologists, and you're wondering, well, I know something, right, about the history of Russian design. I heard about Rochenko and Lisitsky, but this is graphic design, kind of product design. It's something which happened 100 years ago. How is it possibly relevant to what we're going to work on now, which is you know, smart objects, right? Uh, and maybe even metaverse, if uh, uh, Facebook, you know, will, forces to live there. Well, let me show you my watch, right? So I'm not, not sure you know this brand. It's the smartest watch of them all. And it's uh, mostly analog, but there is a complete right, digital display. It has all the sensors, right? So it measures everything. Uh, it actually measures more than, I, than um, iWatch. And uh, because it's also mostly analog, I only have to charge battery once a month, once in 30 days. So I think that the future belongs to this kind of digital analog hybrids. While everybody is getting excited about metaverse, uh, as somebody who been experiencing, uh, working in and writing about computer graphics and VR for 36 years, I think the future is actually belongs to something like this. Uh, I actually think that within our lifetime, the screens will disappear. We'll go back to you know, physical, um, objects, physical textures, which of course will be enhanced with all the uh, capacities and functions of a digital network computation and AI. And this is why I think uh, the work of um, early 20th, uh, Russian 20th century designers and also even less known experiments in the 50s, 60s, and 70s are incredibly relevant uh, because just as we're colleagues from Bauhaus, you know, the Russian design sort of Russian founders of modern design work across disciplines, right? So we would design furniture and objects and buildings, but also, for example, the famous, you know, tribuna, right? For Lenin to speak or the kiosk, uh, you know, or like a library where the workers would go and study the latest multimedia, right? With photo magazines over time. So we kind of work across media. And uh, this is one of many reasons why you should really learn about it. Um, and another reason is that everybody knows about Bauhaus, but some of the things we'll talk about, which is the equivalent Russian school, which was called Futimas, which was uh, 10 times larger, right? Because after Stalin came to power, you know, everything was closed. And, uh, you know, where memory, where heritage became relatively, you know, unaccessible. And only now, you know, with people like Alona, we're beginning to really understand what happened. So there's a great design potential in history of Russian design, which I think you can all use in your work. So this is it. And now, you know, I'll let Alena lead. Thank you, Lev. Um, I've prepared uh, not a regular presentation as we discussed. So in order to avoid linear structure and have more flexibility in our conversation, we're going to use uh, Miro now and uh, look through some slides that I prepared, but 
uh, in a format of a free conversation. And because we uh, started from, uh, from Futamas, I also going to uh, show you some uh, projects that I did for it. But uh, um, probably the first thing I wanted to mention in the whole exhibition project that is actually take uh, place now at the Old Russian Museum of Decorative Arts because I started this research two years ago and it's not just an exhibition about the history of project design um, product design in Russia so we talk about industrially produced objects we talk about craft objects we talk about how these issues blend together also with contemporary digital technology just as left men mentioned but also this would be the first stage of forming the first uh, in Russia state permanent exposition on the history of um, Russian design. And one of the biggest problems and challenges that I faced when I was thinking about this project is that uh, too many object uh, state uh, unreleased uh, during the Soviet uh, era, so on different stages of uh, Soviet history, from avant-garde to the late the crisis of uh, Soviet economy, planned economy, the, for political and both political and economical issues, so many interesting proposals of Russian artists and designers never went into the mass production, or they were. So we now only know about them because of some technical drawings or sketches or pictures of uh, uh, paper models or prototypes that were, and even uh, the models themselves are now lost. So in order to visualize this uh, heritage, we have to create over 25 reconstructions starting from 1970s, the early earliest reconstruction that we had. This, uh, um, Floor lamps were designed by Alexander Rochenko as early as in um, 1917 uh, for the avant-garde futurist uh, cafe Pittoresque in Moscow. And next year, they after they were created, so the whole cafe was set on fire. And we only have a few black and white drawings left that we were looking at in order to recreate those pieces. We knew that the, some of them were made from cardboard and some from metal. And so we had to look at Rochenko's uh, paintings of those uh, years uh, in order to get an idea of some colors. We uh, cons uh, consulted with the grandson of Alexander Rochenko. And only when they, they were all done and the final um, bulb were turned on, uh, you can actually see the ideas of reflected col colorful light that was behind the, this whole uh, uh, lamp's idea. And we also use textual descriptions of the visitors of the cafe that was placed inside this historical building in the very center of Moscow. So uh, this just to give you an idea of uh, what we try to work with. So sometimes we had an exact technical drawings, like in case of this uh, Sietin, uh, Nikolai Sietin furniture uh, set inspired by suprematist ideas of his uh, teacher, Kazimir Malevich. Uh, but sometimes we had to be much more creative and we also benefited a lot from digital reconstruction. So if we get back to uh, Futamas. This is a preview of an exhibition at the Museum of Moscow, where I created a part dedicated to the wood and metalworks department. And you can see some of my reconstructions uh, there. For example, with this famous uh, chair designed by Nikolai Ragozhin under a supervision of Vladimir Tatlin in his material culture workshop. Um, it was very complicated story and in order to recreate it we um, heavily use digital technologies but we also uh, consulted with engineers and specialists in tonnet furniture because it was originally uh, Vladimir Tatlin's idea that because we cannot afford, unlike Europe, unlike Bauhaus, unlike America, uh, produce mass production of furniture from tubular steel, uh, we can instead uh, try to develop our own techniques of um, working with uh, wood, steamed, steamed wood. So this whole construction that we did, and I used um, inform the inf information from the only publication that Tatlin did while he was still alive with this picture of this chair. So we use this image for to search for original proportions. And here in a text, he mentioned that it is uh, one inch diameter. So 
if we make it one inch and if we scale it proportionally, if we calculate how oh, the chair is supposed to function as a wooden spring, as he mentioned that because he was the first person, the first person among all Russian avant-garde artists who decided to look not into the industry, but into actually organic proportions and limits of the human body. And in order to make the sitting comfortable for a long period of time, he wanted to invent this wooden spring. And only, uh, you know, there are many um, later versions of uh, this chair. For example, uh, at the um, publication of the uh, decorative uh, arts of uh, the USSR magazine in the 1960s, where it was still be, uh, became possible to talk about the avant-garde experience that we had, as it was abandoned for during the Stalin's era. Uh, you see here that they actually um, manipulated the image and it doesn't have this frontal part in here. So it was a kind of censorship, I guess because uh, Tatlin intended it to look like a bicycle seat to, for better ergonomic characteristics. And uh, many of contemporary versions done in Italy, for example, starting from 70s, they, first of all, they are from metal. That, was, that is totally against Tatlin ideas. And then they try to fit it to a height of a normal table. And therefore, the chair appears too low and disproportional. So with a height of uh, 750 uh, millimeters, it doesn't look right. And we were looking for a normal proportion. So we started from this low proportion to fit the uh, table as we expected, but we saw that it was all completely wrong. And measuring different versions, we ended up with a original proportion that is between 860 to even 1920. Uh, millimeters so it is closer to the proportion of a bar chair um, and this is, is the type of uh, discoveries that you run into when you dig deeper into the digital and physical reconstructions of the objects as I call them uh, for the uh, presentation intangible objects first of all because many of them were just um, futuristic ideas but then because even though the projects that were possible to make back then, most of them, they were never put into the mass production, like this set of Galatona furniture that was compared with the Bauhaus by the press. Um, here, I also wanted to, oh, sorry, just a second. Um, this is another chair that Petr Galaktionov did uh, as his uh, graduation project. And you can see how uh, it is uh, similar to the famous Vasily chair. Uh, we actually compared proportions. We studied how it was uh, all uh, created uh, as, a, as a set. We had many questions about the way it was uh, fixed. And, and we are very happy that nowadays we can see it. Also for this Futimas projects, what I did, I saw that it was interesting that there were uh, four leading um, avant-garde uh, teachers at the department. There were no women um, there, and that's another part <laughs> of my research and of my story. But I've uh, tried, because of uh, Alexandra Silvana was the head creator of the exhibition, she decided that uh, we only show works of students, not the famous teachers. I found uh, one chair to represent each uh, teaching approach, teaching method of each pedagogue to show. So it is this uh, wood spring chair uh, created by Vladimir Tatlian. Then this this almost Bauhaus looking chair created by Alexander Rochenka. Uh, a chair that was a foldable combination of uh, metal and wood uh, created by Laza Lisitsky. And it is interesting that mm. uh, this uh, first uh, chair, done as early as 1925, that shows more decorative characteristics of the early avant-garde experiments, was created by Anton Lavinsky. And it's the same student, so you can actually see how from this uh, very decorative and non-functional uh, approach, uh, with actually lots of mistakes that we found inside this uh, technical drawing, he ended up with very well set off in terms of materials and tiny details, uh, chair that looks so uh, um, almost uh, contemporary and can be found in many later 
uh, projects. Um, so this is, and, and also for Elisitsky, for our exhibition, I also did uh, a model that we recreated in very tiny details. So uh, Lisitsky, as an architect in the first place, he oriented his students uh, to design um, uh, furniture sets for the real apartments. And this was an experimental format of an apartment uh, done by Maisie Ginsburg, the famous F type uh, living cell in. And so uh, living cell, here we did the whole paper model. We also corrected lots of mistakes that were done over 100 years ago. And I found lots of interesting um, discoveries together with the students of the British High School of Arts and Design. So it was a very interesting project for them as well to work with materials done by other students, but over 100 years ago. We did an animation, digital animation for these projects to analyze how these beds were folding, how the lights were moving, because it was all about uh, combinational furniture. For example, you can see how this uh, four individual benches uh, arrange a sofa attached uh, in, in combination with this uh, soft part attached to the wall. And we also discovered this small table lamp that was not present on other attempt, reconstruction attempts. And uh, also within this uh, table, I have also found a couple of comparison with Marcel Breuer's and other uh, Bauhaus uh, teacher's works, but uh, the proportion of these legs uh, looked quite ridiculous uh, to me. One of the reasons was that they were trying to save as much metal as possible because it was still only a fantasy. And as um, Yelena Simeonova, an architect from um, uh, Hutemas uh, said, how could we humble uh, students of Hutemas dream about furniture from, um, as she called them, bicycle tubes? But hell yes, we did. <laughs> and uh, so this was only a, a small uh, proportion. But I found this uh, same model of uh, table produced during the 1960s um, in Czech Republic. Uh, so uh, it, it could still be found on a Russian eBay for a very <laughs> small amount of money. It's another part of uh, cross connection between the Futemas and Bauhaus. And another story to tell probably is about history of uh, um, Banted uh, plywood within this uh, Elisitsky chair that we also reconstructed, and it was uh, all, uh, done in 1928 and then shown at Dresden in 1929 as a part of the uh, full size interior of the living uh, selling in Hygiene um, exhibition. And uh, the uh, curved uh, shape of the back of the chair is. Um, in a style with this curved uh, uh, line um, on, uh, under which um, the uh, move, uh, movable part of uh, the wall could be transformed into a, a cupboard or in, into a bed. Uh, so you know, we know how this uh, history of the banded plywood in the uh, Soviet Union, and this was one of the earliest projects during the Soviet era. Before the Soviet era, of course, there were some uh, cases uh, too. And how it was um, later um, in line with the whole history of modernist organic uh, design. And we can mention Alvar Alta, or we can look at uh, the forms of the 1960s furniture, all done by similar uh, techniques later on. And also, uh, I was the first to recreate in a full size and calculate uh, the possible dimension of this uh, set of um, modular furniture. Um, furniture combinat, the way Lisitsky called it. So he saw that uh, five basic elements would be enough for a single person to create a multifunctional uh, living environment for both walking, sleeping, storing clothing. So this is well, like a case so is from the late can, 1920s. Sorry, uh, this is basically what you can get in IKEA, but I think IKEA will sell you 20 things, right? So Lisitsky was actually even more extreme and, uh, and talented in his thinking. He said, basically, you can have your whole life out of five elements, right? Um, sorry for interrupting, but just wanted to mention, uh, because I'm, I am a big fan of IKEA, uh, which was started in the late 60s. So again, uh, it kind of supports what I always feel, but we live in a world, we live in a world which was invented between 1919, 1925, 
in uh, Moscow and Berlin, right? We haven't left this world, but often when we go back to this world, we find where ideas are even more creative than what we have today. Please continue. Uh, yeah, so I would actually really enjoy if we have more of uh, this, okay. uh, to have more of these interruptions to have a more... Well, I mean, if you, if you don't mind, I mean, can, I make, can I maybe make, I mean, is it okay if I make one more comment? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. So um, so I think one of the amazing things which you're showing here, right, is that you um, were able to figure out that these things have color and they construct them in color. So to me, it's a complete eye-opening it's, you know, it's like, you know, when you first learn that the ancient Greek st statues were not white, right? And we all have colors. But of course, you know, we, when you go to a museum, you will never know. And uh, one of the problems is that uh, color photography, of course, already existed in the 19th century, but on an experimental basis, right? And um, I haven't seen a single color photograph uh, which would document any kind of work, uh, you know, workshops, students, projects, in the kind of Russian avant-garde arts in the 1920s, even 1930s, right? So everything we, which was preserved, which are just a few pictures are black and white. So I think you're making this amazing kind of paradigm shift uh, because we know a lot about, right? You know, Bauhaus, uh, color and Bauhaus, we have notes for, you know, courses in color, and we have notes for also you know, teaching color in Futimas, but to actually see the actual colors Rochin Kainavar's design is completely kind of fascinating. And I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just make one more quick comment. So I think there is an uncanny uh, connection between, uh, for example, this wood furniture, which you're showing and what's happening today, uh, because both Russia, right? And after the revolution and war in Germany after war, which ended in 1918 and Germany lost, you know, the economic situation was, you know, awful, right? And, uh, this is one of the reasons, right? I think when both Hutimas and Bauhaus creators and teachers uh, started to investigate and then promote this kind of minimalist, right? Uh, Anti-classical modernist design, no ornaments, right? Straight angles, using metals, because it was also most economical, right? Because suddenly you have to house millions of people and meanwhile the economy is in shingles. And as a result, right? And Russia was probably had worse situation than Germany until uh, late twenties. And this is why, you know, people like uh, Lisitsky, right? And others uh, you were discussing, suddenly start working with like, existing kind of cheap materials with wood and so on. And that's in a way situation which we're facing now, right? We have metal, we have plastic, but we don't want to use them, right? Because now we have uh, a, a different war going on, which is our war against what we created, which is a climate change, right? And it's becoming more and more serious. So people, I mean, so progressive architects are constantly investigating already for a number of years, right? Uh, the, how we can make architecture more ecological, right? How can architecture have less of a kind of destructive footprint uh, using bamboo, using paper and so on. So that's, I think, another reasons why this experiment and ideas of, uh, of German, but in this case, Russian designers are so relevant because we're kind of facing in a way, a very similar problem, right? The population is growing, all these people who came back from war, right, started making babies, getting married, and meanwhile, there are no resources. So this idea, like, how do you create uh, humanistic, efficient, beautiful design using as little resources as possible is very, very re relevant. So that's all, that's all I wanted to comment so far. So let's continue. Yeah, and uh, from what you said, there are actually two uh, alternative uh, solutions uh, to these issues that could be found inside the Soviet uh, heritage. And one is, of course, to, more about minimalism and what I call here modernist utopia as a direct connection to what I showed you in uh, Laza Elisitsky project. Uh, we should... Uh, I should say a couple of words about Yuri Slutchevsky, who was a leading uh, furniture designer and uh, teacher at Stroganov um, School of uh, Art and Design of starting from uh, late um, 50s when he graduated from there himself. Uh, and he did his uh, PhD on um, methods, um, analytical methods in uh, creation of uh, uh, standardized uh, built uh, furniture sets. Especially he worked with different shelving systems and uh, his works were fundamental for so many Russian researchers and furniture designers. So here for the exhibition, we reconstructed um, uh, 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 this um, 
uh, REC that was uh, first presented in 1961 at the exhibition Arts into Daily Life. So it was even the same approach that into the 1920s, so the direct connection even in titles. And so uh, you can see that it's a completely new type of furniture because it's not supposed to stand uh, close to the wall. It is supposed to separate the uh, apartment into several zones. And it was extremely important with this new uh, Khrushchev's era mass um, um, yes. mm -hmm. um, building uh, approaches. So where finally the family moved from a singular room to the or one family apartment with one larger living room that you have supposed to separate into the sections to have a place for a ch school children to study, a place to relax, a place to uh, have a family dinner. And uh, so this is rock almost rocket-like shape and also looks a, a bit like uh, uh, Astankina TV tower that was done almost um, uh, in the same uh, years. And it's a new cheap materials, including plastics. So it's uh, this uh, aspiration with uh, chemistry and new scientific approaches to modeling. But what uh, is peculiar about Yuri Slachevsky. He dedicated his whole life into calculating a so-called micro module. So he wanted to define a singular model on the a certain grid, modernist grid, under which you can uh, measure all proportions of the um, furniture inside the apartment, especially storage furniture. And he um, looked at the model or into many other uh, ergonomic uh, researches that started back then and he calculated that it should be 32 millimeters exactly 32 mil millimeters so many colleagues made uh, laugh about that especially from the architecture department they're saying like we're using three meters one meters okay maybe you want to have 50 mil millimeters but why <laughs> 32 <laughs> and he said that we are not going to build furniture from uh, one wall to another from the floor to the ceilings we want to measure it not with architectural model but we want to measure it with a human proportions that's why we need 32 millimeters. <laughs> and um, uh, in the end, um, uh, in 1972, they um, created a state uh, standard for building furniture and these 32 millimeters were there. So he won <laughs> with, within this approach. And uh, there's some of these standards still affecting uh, nowadays. And here is also an interesting connection. So I showed you this first uh, design project done by Alexander Rochenka. And this is an example of a task that he gave to his students in Futemas. So this is a project uh, of uh, four or uh, even fifth, uh, five uh, table lamps done by his students, uh, a student, Abram Damsky, who later became a leading specialist in uh, lightings at the USSR. And of course, during the Stalin's era, he designed uh, many, um, sorry, uh, he designed many um, Stalin's empire and historical eclectic uh, lighting systems, but uh, as early as in 1957, when it was still all, uh, possible to return to the minimalist uh, visual language that they developed uh, uh, doing some avant-garde exercises, he designed this lamp that became uh, mass-produced and it used in many Soviet schools. And uh, even at the underground, you can see that as early as in 19. 57 on Kutuzovska train uh, station. And here it is interesting that uh, Rochenko's task was the first one, not just to design a shape of a lamp, but he wanted uh, his students to design a lamp that would allow a movable, uh, suggest a movable principle to create a dynamic lighting. And for example, this uh, construction uh, could be found in uh, wooden uh, light pieces uh, from uh, 17th century. <laughs> so it's an, also an interesting mixture of approaches. And then he wanted to, designers to be able to create an industrial series of objects. So you can also he see it here. And this is a, one of a brilliant example of a connection between 1920s and 1960s. And we also have this lamp uh, at the exposition at the museum. And then if we uh, talk about this uh, whole idea of uh, creating a system of objects um, well, that was possible to do within a Soviet, Soviet system of a plant economy in this larger scale, an interesting concept that arose from Dmitry's Azrikan uh, research was the concept of design programs. So this was a whole new uh, type of systematical approach to design. It started with this 
Electromera project, while instead of uh, 1,500 different electronic measurement devices, they ended up with this standard set of blocks. And they also, so it was a complex program that involved um, working environment for people who produce these techniques, um, corporate identity in order to better export those products. Uh, these basic cases, and most importantly, when this uh, project came to the All Union Institute for Technical Aesthetics, uh, ergonomist department said, okay, in order to find an optimal way to manipulate or with 1,500 uh, devices, we will need to a research taken several years in order to find optimal uh, position of uh, buttons for each device. And Dmitry Azrikan said, no, we're doing it the other ways around. You don't design a separate piano for each musical play. So instead, we just uh, use reasonable amount of uh, buttons and controllers that will be placed mm. in the same place and people would know where to find them. So he turned well, it... Sorry, yeah. but this, so this is what's amazing, right? Is that it's exactly this years, like 1973, 1977, when at Xerox Park, Alan Kay and his colleagues articulate this idea of a graphical user interface, right? Which which we all know from Macintosh's PC. And the key thing about this interface was that you have the same, right? You have the same menus, the same functions of the software, right? You have cut, paste, finder. And this is exactly the same idea, but actually probably for the first time expressed in the industrial design. So it's completely, so, sorry I interrupted, but it just, it just, you know, you're just opening this amazing universe, so I couldn't control myself, sorry. Yeah, that, that is so great because, uh, for example, this is a comics, we now translate it, uh, it into Russian. A, a comics explaining what design program is, what it could be mm -hmm. for the uh, Soviet exhibition in uh, Stuttgart. Mm -hmm. And uh, so where he, um, because uh, he later developed this whole complex even further. So, he, for example, this is a comparison with a piano play and the way you can place all objects in line. But I also wanted to comment on this uh, 3D model that Dmitry uh, Azaykan uh, developed. It is also could fully covered in this uh, technical um, aesthetics magazine article because um, he wanted to think not of a singular object. Uh, to compete on the market. But for example, um, he uh, shows cases it on example of refrigerators. For example, if we wanted to design a new refrigerator, we came with this task. Uh, we can look in a uh, free direction. First, we have a functional complex. So this is a dimension where we look to all devices as could potentially freeze food or just freeze anything. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we have the uh, environmental uh, layout. And this is a dimension where we looked at uh, where this refrigerator is used. So we look in the context of kitchen or we looked in the context of a um, portable uh, device mm -hmm. for a picnic or so we look, or we look at the industrial refrigerator. So we're trying to see all possible um, cases of environmental application of this device that already gives us an idea of uh, what it could be. And then finally, um, Pabetsonne complex, it's a um, um, uh, uh, thing that you uh, look at the refrigerator in the context of the whole production done by the factory that produced it. So it's uh, also in the context of their corporate identity, like what they want to build a visual, even Chefun, like we produce refrigerators and heaters, for example, on a contrast on or only some, 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 something from turbulent steel, I don't know. So it's um, about how to build uh, this refrigerator into the context of the whole uh, amount of products uh, by the, done by the particular industry. And this is an amazing um, uh, system that he looks at. And later on, uh, this approach um, uh, actually was supposed to help uh, people as um, dealing with assortment uh, policy. As Yuri Solovyov, uh, for director of NIETE, pointed out at his speech at the Exit Congress, mm -hmm. we want to um, use this assortment policy uh, not in order to limit people, uh, although, of course, it was... Uh, 
an, an, an idea of uh, saving resources and uh, saving people's body too. But you know, they wanted to make sure that everybody can find something they need because before they started uh, this analysis, for example, there was a huge amount of uh, electric uh, shavers on the market. In mm -hmm. the USSR. So seven different factories in different regions of USSR mm -hmm. produced electric shavers. And technically, they were almost similar. Stylistically, they were a little different, but not so much. And then what's the point of producing them? Uh, what if we can have only one kind of uh, device? But at the same time, if we apply this approach, then we can identify how many different uh, electric shavers or in the case of this uh, program, uh, um, what type of uh, magnetophones do we need for different uh, type of people? Like, so one should be for, or two should be for teenagers, one should be for technical technique lovers, one should be for someone who listens to the classics and want to have a, a fashionable apartment, one should be for, teen, uh, for um, uh, people to take a uh, device outside on a picnic or for tourists so uh, in the mountains so it should be unbreakable it should be foldable so they actually using this uh, schema they were producing a variety of objects that were supposed to fit a variety of possible variety of people's needs but on a limited basis uh, uh, totally fascinating um so what i want to say is i think just to point out how incredibly relevant it is to uh, what's happening now and what will be happening in decades to come right so while this extreme kind of modernist, right, very idealistic, but very practical program for, you know, the kind of universal design, right, of a small number of limited type of particular product, but which will address a variety of needs is being carried out in Soviet Union, the West, right, the capitalistic society, of course, is, is advancing uh, planned obsolescence, right, where every year there are new models, Sometimes we have, right, every, every, you know, every few months we have new phones from many companies, you know, they may be just different at 1%, even if we throw them away. Um, and this was kind of okay. I mean, we thought it was okay for the 20th century, but now in a way we can going back, right, to this uh, more modernist and more Soviet way of thinking, uh, because for the last 15 years, the designers talk, try to figure out how an economist and um, uh, enthusiast are talking about how we can move to society of, uh, responsible consumption, right? So we don't want to go back to uh, complete restriction, but we don't want to, right, keep polluting environment and um, destroying nature with endless, endless models, you know, which are, you have to buy a new one in a few months. Um, so again, uh, I'm, I feel that you are like this amazing kind of pioneer, you know, you are like a spaceship, right, which goes to the moon. Because even like I never I never seen any of this stuff, right? And I've been interested in this all my life. And I really feel that in the coming decades, so many designers will be interested in this and it will become famous just because we're finally getting to a point in the human development, right? In a global country society where what these people are working on in the 20s, 50s, and 70s are becoming incredibly, incredibly relevant. Thank you, Lev. And uh, just another example, because we um, talk about this, uh, also in our exhibition, we talk about this DIY culture and sustainable approach inside the Soviet design culture. An exam a perfect example is our reconstruction of a 1975 cardboard furniture set that were done for the International Exit uh, Congress in Moscow. So original design belonged to 1975. And it was a huge set of furniture. And the whole idea was to transform the pathetic marble interiors of the Russia um, um, hotel and uh, where the uh, whole place was held uh, into something more democratic uh, because the topic of the Congress were designed for people and society. It was the only exit Congress in USSR. And after that, U.S. Solovyov, the head of the Russian um, of Nieta, was uh, chosen the, for a couple of years as a president of an exit. A few people know that the exit uh, had a Soviet president for a couple of years. As U.S. Solovyov uh, joked himself, I was not allowed to leave uh, USSR, so I had to become a president of an international organization in order to travel. And so uh, within this uh, furniture set, so why do you need uh, something um, from expensive materials if it's only a couple of days event? 
and all the cardboard were afterwards recycled, except for a couple of chairs, because I actually managed to find an original 1955 chair in the apartment of the uh, designer, Yevgeny Bogdanov. And so then it was all easy to move to rearrange in various sets. So the whole concept was democratic. Uh, many people met together. They decided to arrange their own space to talk. And then the cardboard stands allowed every person to attach his own information without asking a permission. So it was all about this democratic idea. And Igor Berezovsky did this amazing graphic design with multiplied pictures uh, of people walking through all the documents. So it was a dynamic identity created in 1975. And to me, it looks also amazing because there was no singular logo. There was this uh, textual part and then a constantly uh, moving images of people oh, among oh, all the documentation. I see, I see, I see. So a kind of variable design, which is also, mm -hmm. which is still emerging as the format. And, you know, uh, we, I don't think we'll have time today to talk about to what extent this parallels or not what was happening, you know, in, in um, Scandinavian countries, so Germany, Italy, you know, we're also all kinds of radical design programs, you know, were uh, proposed. So this is for another time. But I just want to mention that if you look at the history of computers, right, uh, until the end of the 60s, Russians and Americans were basically inventing things in parallel. Sometimes Russian would be ahead by one year, sometimes Americans. And probably something similar was happening between cap design in communist countries and design in so-called capitalist countries. Uh, so while, you know, we may find some of the solutions Maybe maybe done in France or or Denmark few years late few years before, and then I think we'll probably find other ideas which didn't arrive in the West until ten years later, right? But that's a, would be a very interesting conversation for another time. Uh, and the last thing I want to say at this moment: all this work which you're showing simply proves, I think, a point which I have to write a book to to make it clear that the real modernism happened in communist countries, right? Uh, because Modernism, in a way, has become the official design, design in visual language for modernist countries, not the socialist realism, but modernism. Uh, all the stuff was mass produced. There was no competition. Even if you wanted to buy some tasteless old style furniture, you couldn't. Unfortunately, when it came to production, right, not, not all of it was easy to buy for consumers. It was often bad quality, but ideologically, right, you know, USSR was the most modern in society. And uh, it's something we'll have to also slowly come to terms with when we, and we have to rewrite the whole history of 20th century culture. Um, so I'm making this big leap, but I think this example showed very clearly uh, because these people are trying to you know, address design problems, right, on the scale of the whole country, very much continuing the ideas about uh, artists moving into the industry, you know, which basically gave rise, gave rise to Futimas. And also I want to say that this idea that artists should really become designers it happened in Hutimas five years before it happened in Bauhaus, right? So in Hutimas, that was the idea from the beginning, going into industry, redefining the everyday life for the industry in 1919. In Bauhaus, this idea only came after a new director in 1924. Um, so that's another thing, you know, which we'll slowly have to educate more people about. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, but- I'm sorry, same... I, I think, I'm sorry I'm stealing seconds because uh, I'm, you know, but. And I know you have to go in a while because you have another seminar, but uh, so I'll be quiet. Just show us as much as you can. We shouldn't be in the Russian. I really enjoy your commentaries and I will be looking, will be the first <laughs> reader of your book. <laughs> and uh, oh, two commentaries that I have in mind uh, regarding what you said. First of all, yes, of course, we will. The whole history of Russian design is about artists coming to industry and industry denying their proposals because first happened in the 20s due to the uh, economic problems after the revolution, then to, to, to the political reasons before because so for uh, conflicts with Russian avant-garde artists that were not fitted new state ideology anymore. And uh, then during the 1960s for a short period of time with the creation of Institute of Technical Aesthetic. And mm. so it, it worked for a while, but mm, as soon as by the uh, mid 70s already, mm -hmm. You know, the only uh, point of control that uh, VNITE as a scientific organization had mm -hmm. over the industry was the uh, qualification on the state quality mark. They I could see. do it or they could deny it. And it was the only way how state could uh, force uh, producers to implement new technologies into the production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, starting from the mid-70s, it doesn't 
it stops working. People only want to make plan on time. Different different agents in society want to move in different directions. And I think this was a big mistake of modern thinking, right? We thought if it's just going to make great design, the industry will follow. But all the ministries, right, all the bosses had their own ideas. And that's why lots of this incredibly uh, progressive modernist ideas in Soviet Union didn't really come to didn't come to practice, I think. Such as, then, you know, also, you know, but, you know Russia invented first internet in 1955, but they didn't build it for the same reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the greatest uh, strategy behind it, for example, was Nite, was that it was created inside the Ministry of Science and later oh. it turned into the uh, Ministry of Education. So why not creating it inside the Ministry of Industrial Production? If it was there, then it was a direct connection. And uh, up till nowadays, these were a completely disconnected organization. So one is about science, another is about production. <laughs> and mm-hmm. they developed, uh, so all the late Soviet projects that I'm interested in, uh, they were uh, either futuristic proposals that I'll show now, or they were um, artistic proposals for single pieces or DIY pieces. Like, for example, for the first time, we reconstructed this also 1975 uh, Mebar furniture project. So it was an idea of uh, mixing. Oh, uh, my, okay. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm, an I'm idea just... of mixing furniture and architecture, oh oh an idea God. of breaking this modular, modernist modular grid inside the apartment. So as uh, um, Alexander Sikachev told us, I was uh, Alexander Simonov, another uh, Soviet design historian who helped me with this uh, project, that uh, when everybody, uh, all designers were coming to uh, fabric, uh, they were asking, give us the best uh, samples of materials that you have, because we want to build something for the furniture exhibition. So it doesn't it didn't matter for them that none of the regular soviet citizen will be able to get these materials afterwards that it would never go to the mass production at least they wanted to do something for an exhibition and sikachev and lachkova they did it other way around they told us give us the cheapest material that you have the most affordable one the one that anybody could get afterwards and that they, they produced this system of this modular shield fixated on um, uh, royal strings so uh, you can actually get any amount of uh, volume from the wall or from the selling that you oh. need, that you want. And there are so many applications, so you can decorate it. They also proposed an open storage that was a very revolutionary concept. Uh, Sikachev said that you buy yes. product in a package, then you throw away the package boxes and you put uh, this object into the boxes of cupboards. Why for? You can store them in a boxes from the uh, shops or if you, you can store cl- uh, clothing in this... Uh, uh, this way or you can if you need you can create a textile sidings for this design then you can see that it could be a complete uh, idea of how to transform living rooms for example for children rooms he also suggests making um uh, uh different uh climbing constructions from it or oh, so it could be a library it could be a sleeping room it could be whatever you want and they suggested that they just give a DIY instruction to the users and they could make something uh, unique for themselves. And uh, we have a whole set uh, inside the exhibition dedicated to this DIY structure. So for Alexander Simonov took this um, idea mm-hmm. and designed his own settings of Mebar for our exposition. So we have it in here. And we actually wanted to see, so well, these are the lines that you're supposed to put inside your apartment. And they are because they're modular, they're still very easy to transport and to install. And they held based on these shelves. And here in this uh, section of the exhibition, I mixed two topics together. Uh, so the DIY culture and uh, its contemporary interpretation and um, uh, contemporary designers inspired by the folk art, while they have the same qualities of sustainability of multiple reuse of a singular object, they all there. And I also uh, am the first uh, person to uh, introduce many uh, designers who immigrated from the USSR, did their career abroad and became famous worldwide, but they're still uh, not known or less known in Russia and they never were all together in a singular museum exposition. So for example, I was very happy to get uh, Konstantin Boim uh, works or Boris Berlin. They are now a part of the uh, museum's uh, collections. For example, his, uh, for, well, th- these are parts of his first uh, set recycle. It's in a montage, so the glasses should be here. Uh, or the first prototype that he did for Moy. So the way journalists put it, he um, 
created these wooden frames for the regular everyday objects. And a journalist said that he uh, framed the trash, but it was this project as early as the late 80s that he started his career in New York with these uh, bold uh, examples of uh, different, completely different approach uh, to everyday objects, to design, to multiple reuse of objects. So he turns it into the base or his later prototype for uh, Moy that was a salvation project. A very good expression of the postmodernist design paradigm. And I think Boyan was doing it already in mid 80s. I remember seeing stuff in New York. It was, you know, it was really very, you know, very visible. It wasn't all basically but probably still not known in Russia. Yeah, and we'll now have a separate exhibition dedicated to Konstantin Boyum in, at the museum because he uh, gave many of his pieces there and same uh, similar stories for later um, uh, designers, Boris Berlin, Vadim Kibardin, they all working outside of um, Russia and worked out, uh, Berlin, Boris Berlin also worked outside of USSR in Denmark. But then there are so many ways you can connect this uh, sustainable approach to things that you create and to the choice of materials. Um, for example, within this nobody chair, he got inspired by the textile covers that his parents uh, in Soviet Russia put into um, uh, country house furniture and dachas before they left it uh, for winter. And in spring, you have to unfold all these textile covers to see what's behind it. And so this nobody chair, it's a a uh, single standing sheet from a uh, 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 material that is done uh, like a fetter, but it's done from a recycled polyester bottles. And it stands all by itself like a miracle. He had to develop his own uh, machine in order to produce it. So oh it's, it's an archetype of a chair. Oh my God. Oh my God. So and he was also, he was, very, he was very practical. I thought he was really like designer artist. I didn't realize he would actually wanted to do things for mass production. Okay, no, amazing. No, no, no. They are all very practical, but at the same time, uh, it's I, I believe that there is certain attitude towards uh, uh, the way you produce things that connects all these people together, also inside our exposition. Uh, considering the time left, there are two small topics that I also wanted to cover. One is this futuristic design approach. So as a designer for uh, producing something for DIY, production or a single pieces like artistic design. Uh, another approach was this uh, futuristic proposals. Um, in order to illustrate it uh, properly. Um, well, okay, yeah, just from the start. So um, the last section of the exhibition that I show, I talk about uh, things as friends that Alexander Rochenko proposed, but on a new technological level, whereas we have uh, artificial intelligence, so when we have internet of things that for the first time probably allowed people to, uh, allowed things to be relatively independent, autonomous from people even inside the written scenarios, but still. So we have this uh, contemporary uh, uh, Russian projects uh, of smart home, of uh, smart mm -hmm. speakers using Alisa from Yandex, and it's not another one. They are now based in uh, United States, but uh, the whole company is Russian. That was important for me as well. And here I reconstruct the first uh, prototype uh, from a Soviet smart home designed as early as in 1969. 19, okay, okay, 1969. I just want to make it clear. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the uh, the first proposals were from 1969 to 1968, and uh, the uh, this model was shown at the exhibition um, in 1972. So this was a whole size model, not a fully functional, of course, but it was a collaborative project between. Um, Vniete uh, and Ni Gerikont in St. Petersburg, and uh -huh. back then Leningrad. And this, wow. I was so happy to find this uh, picture in full color because I consulted uh, uh, Evgeny Bogdanov and uh, Vladimir Papirny, who were designers of uh, uh, this uh, thing uh, back then. And Vladimir Papirny? Uh, yes, uh, in collaboration with Evgeny Bogdanov, he did that. <laughs> I interviewed him about it uh, as well. Uh, and because when I looked at those magazine pictures, I always thought, okay, maybe it's a coffee or maybe it's a grayscale, but a yeah. beige. But I never imagined it in full color to look like this. Wow. And I think and you it, should I think you should translate, you know, the caption. The caption says the, uh, the model 
of a home information machine. Yeah, so right? DIM is a home information home machine. Home information machine, 1968. And you know, uh, because I study, right, history of information technology, I uh, I mean, there are videos, right, which were produced at the time, at t et cetera. But I've, I don't think anybody, uh, it is in America, have man, imagined si something as amazing as this. So this is absolutely revolutionary. Okay. Yeah, uh, I just want... Yeah. I'm sitting because otherwise I would just I would just I would just I would just you know drop down the floor because it's so shocking. Yeah, thank you. And the idea it was because uh, computers were the size of a cupboard, they created a series of cupboards, and uh, the way uh, suggested the way uh, they could uh, also transform apartments in different styles to make different functional zones inside the apartments. Uh, and then there were also these movable parts. Some of them you can hide inside of these cupboards when they are not needed. Or some of them they are just connected and they're supposed to receive uh, video and media audio information from these uh, uh, computers uh, hidden inside these cupboards. And there were so many uh, cases of applications and they also talked that in the future we are supposed to influence the whole audiovisual climate of the living environment. So they imagined people entering the room with a uh, colorful lights changing with the video projections on the wall, they all had it described. And so, uh, of course, they looked at the international projects and uh, I guess it's a co Columbus living model as well, but so uh, there were so many uh, interesting ideas inside of it. And the exhibition, I show it also close to this model, so you can actually see them together, because Gustav Klutzis was also innovative in terms of uh, media, multimedia use back then, and with his agitation constructions, first of all, he built them a year before uh, mass radio technology was possible in USSR, so he called it a radio orator, but uh, many researchers believe that here inside the box there was a regular, supposed to, they were supposed to hide a regular gramophone just to show how from um, vinyl uh, records or Sherlock records back then you can actually uh, make sound here. And also here this is uh, a model that we did, it's only with a text, uh, but uh, First of all, it could rotate, and then there were alternative models that had screen on top. So it was, they were supposed to, to have a, a video projection there. So it's in this case, they are quite <laughs> similar, I guess. Uh, but uh, from this project, it, I was also amazed to discover that design after Vladimir Papirn and Evgeny Bogdanov left Nieta, the next team that came to an idea of a smart housing uh, led by Dmitry Azekan in 1986. They had no idea of this previous project as well, even inside singular institution. Mm -hmm. uh, but and the thing of for uh, this uh, radio electronical equipment for the housing of uh, the future, and actually they mentioned a year two thousand for which they designed. So stylistically, I think they got it quite uh, clear. And. Uh, also, Dmitry Azekan, after he left USSR, he became a professor of um, industrial design in America. So <laughs> there is no wonder why. And uh, But the thing is that it all started with a seminar ex uh, that Exit organized together with uh, Vniete. And it was originally, the seminars were an idea of Yuri Slavyov, who did a practical workshop exchange uh, for international designers. And in Yerevan in 1985, they worked... I mean, in contemporary Armenia, they worked on a topic of the clocks and watches of the future. And Mitri Azekan was one of the first to say that clocks and watches don't have future. <laughs> because <laughs> uh, he said that uh, he had a very logical idea that um, jewelry are uh, with humans starting from the caveman era. And clocks as a variable device are uh, something that is relatively recent in the history of humanity. So the future will be in um, taking uh, clocks um, and especially watch variable watches functionality and dedicating it to the uh, different variable gadgets. It was his um, one of his ideas. So uh, like here, what they proposed. And the, another idea was in splitting um, processor and effectors, as they call them. So one part was responsible, for example, here we were constructed 
one of the, the models. Um, these are our contemporary pictures of our reconstruction, but we um, it consulted a lot of original uh, engineers who worked and designers who worked in the projects. For example, Igor Lysenko helped us to, and he was the original designer of this processor. It's a modular, so you can build it into a tower depending on how much power do you need. And so it was supposed to receive information from the internet 1986, mm -hmm. uh, store it, and um, then deliver it to various effectors um, to in various rooms of the apartment. And uh, effectors included uh, different sizes of speakers and different shapes of foldable speakers here, for example, uh, different sizes of uh, screens. And uh, Igor uh, Lysenko wrote that uh, in an um, international magazine in a Vnietes library, and what you mentioned also uh, about the close connection between the Soviet and international design practice, the reason behind it, one of the biggest reasons was that there were so many international magazines inside of the VNITS library and all other state institutions. So all of the Soviet designers were pretty much aware of what was going on uh, worldwide. So he read that they experimented with um, uh, digital screens uh, for clocks and well, they did a screen in a size of one uh, to two centimeters. And automatically he proposed this type of foldable screens uh, and it is the attachable uh, screen. So this uh, part functions separately. And also they had two models, an orange one was, was with uh, micro buttons. And this one was a touch uh, uh, clavier mm -hmm. that uh, uh, touch uh, touch controller, yeah, keyboard, uh, touch keyboard that he did also in 1986. Um, so there was these different sets of uh, controllers. Um, and uh, another outcome of this uh, seminar was that um, right after 1985, a new program, Clocks and Watch of the Future, started at the Leningrad branch of NIETE. Nobody connected these two projects before, so I'm also was happy to do that. And they were also doing this uh, uh, type of um, system in order to produce clocks for various types of users and watches. And I only, only tell about one project that I reconstructed also as part of my women uh, research uh, project. I did an interview with Tatiana Samoilova, who did this major uh, dome clock project. And the idea is that this gadget uh, lies on your table and so uh, it has uh, dust control or, and other filters. It can be used as a regular calculator, but it co also could be used in order to program these free attachable clips that you attach on your clothing, on a sleeping pillow if you want to use it in an alarm or on your book that you read. And with a sound signal, uh, it reminds you about certain events. So it should help to coordinate life of three different persons that you can program. For example, she said you can put it on your child and even if he or she doesn't know numbers, it will just beep the child when he or she should return home. Or <laughs> So um, it was uh, this idea that uh, at home we don't need to look at the watches, so we don't have to wear them on our hands uh, because when a woman watches uh, dishes or cooks something, it's uh, not comfortable at all. Uh, so this was her proposal, and it was done in 1987. And in 1989, it appeared on a, inside the Technical Aesthetics magazine with a question, who is ready to start producing this device? But of course, in 1998, nobody did. Uh, but we show lots of uh, contemporary uh, projects done by Russian designers and engineers that actually show that many of these ideas come true. Uh, Maybe you want to comment on this part because for the closing section, I would show just a couple of uh, art projects done by women. Sure. Well, I will very briefly comment. And, uh, you know, I'm seriously thinking that everybody who's watching and all the people who would watch later video, we should really get together and we should really crowdfund you. I mean, we should just really raise money so you have comfortable salary from us and you can just spend, you know, next 20 years doing this research and publishing because, you know, you know you're opening this, like it's like new galaxy, right? Which nobody knows about. And uh, it's simply, simply unbelievable. But my comment was that of course, when you think about what was happening in the West, so to speak at the time, I mean, the only company, right? So it was a Brown, right? Brown, 
with uh, Dietmar Rams. Uh, but you know, the devices were not so like, right? I mean, the functions were not so revolutionary. It was just nice design, minimalist. And then was Olivetti, right? So Olivetti was producing, right? Very interesting design. So Olivetti was really the design avant-garde, right? Of the West until Steve Jobs came along, right? And when Steve Jobs introduced Macintosh, it changed the world because of course he was a first computer company which really thought about the user, right? And Steve Jobs always tells the story how what really made him who he was by taking class uh, about uh, you, know, uh, you know Asian calligraphy when he was in college. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, Soviet Union was declining, right? And in 1991, disintegrated. Uh, but if you know, if it was a different country, maybe the whole history of last uh, 30 years of design and the gadgets would be very different. That's all I wanted to say. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, so the last uh, part of my research, I will try to connect uh, two issues, one of artistic design. So just uh, another part of my research was when um, state designers um, uh, by in the late Soviet years, for example, at the Institute of Furniture, during the daytime, they were producing uh, quite ordinary designs of what was possible to um, present by the Soviet uh, industry. But in a free time, also because they had those lectures on international design, they saw those magazines, they want to be very experimental. So I found this group of designers inside the Institute of Furniture, including Alexandra Smagin, Yelena Kasperchik, Nadezhda Veryanova, who tried to be very creative and create, making their own proposals. For example, this uh, uh, leather chair, uh, Scala, uh, we reconstructed, it was, uh, it participated on the um, uh, post-Soviet design exhibition in the mid nineties in uh, Venice, for example, this is the auto, this is our reconstruction, it also has a detachable lamp to it. And this is just such a great contract, uh, contrast with what these designers had to do and produce on a regular basis every day inside the Institute. So the whole Institute of Furniture was a very interesting uh, thing because um, officially it produced uh, furniture for Soviet mass production. Unofficially, they designed uh, uh, historically styled furniture for Kremlin, uh, for Kremlin dachas. So they all worked in um, Rococo, Baroque, uh, um, uh, Empire style. And nobody we're, 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 working, we're working with mass production like with kind of modern design. We're doing this 19th century design for uh, you know for the apparatchik duchess and you know and and on by themselves we're basically developing postmodern design you know along the lines of 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 of, uh, of of memphis for example italy yeah exactly and until you start interviewing those people there is no such book where you can read about their experience <laughs> and i believe it was quite interesting and so i was um, uh, very puzzled when i saw in uh, alexander Lavrentiev and yuri nazarov's book i saw a sketch for this table and i was like no way 1989 who did it this and why and i started researching and it was the same time i started researching on my women's project and uh, so i was lucky to find uh, nadezhda Veryanova, get in touch with the author and the story that she told me behind this table is absolutely fascinating because also they had a lecture by a uh, famous Vinita art historian galina kurierova about international design and so on, and pop art and Dutch design. And then she had a dream in 1989. She had, an, uh, I don't know if it was a nightmare or not, but she saw a Soviet flag on a red square melting into blood, into a stain of blood. And she designed this uh, table. It was her feeling of forced coming to historica, and it stays on three pioneer horns, but without any fixation as a symbol of how fragile this construction is. And we did a first reconstruction because the table itself, it was, uh, she applied on um, uh, this uh, Paris um, exhibition from the newly formed uh, Union of Soviet Designers where she was um, head of uh, uh, furniture design section as a help of Yuri Swachevsky as an, his assistant. And she applied it on this competition and she uh, passed the competition. Uh, the French uh, uh, committee chose this table to participate at the same exhibition where Rochenko and Stepanova presented uh, their works in 1925. And uh, But uh, her head of the institute made an um, artistic committee and uh, where he broke this uh, table with his leg 
saying that it's not a furniture, it shouldn't go anywhere, and she shouldn't either. Uh, but uh, the head of the uh, Union of Designers said that all the works that were chosen should go, all of the designers should go. So she, the table was not there because it was not physically possible to make a new one on time. Uh, but she was in a catalog. She had a proposal for mass production that was uh, of limited series that was also denied by the head of the institute. And we reconstructed this uh, table for the first time. It was also quite a different story how it, to make it as a single piece, not as a mass-produced series. But I'm so, so proud and happy that we finally did that. Also, for example, uh, especially after I learned this story, for example, with uh, this uh, Mebar furniture set that we looked at here, uh, Alexei Sikachev also writes down in his memories uh, that uh, at this exhibition in 1975, uh, the head of the Institute of Furniture told him that uh, he's worse than fascists. It's an exact quote <laughs> because of this proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are now reconstructing and showing these objects and history behind this. Also, for example, uh, reconstructed this set of uh, lamps and it's a very story, interesting story, because Svetlana Usova, she was educated as an engineer, and she uh, was designing, for example, these uh, cassette players and uh, stuff. But um, by the end of the uh, 80s, when they received the uh, task to design several uh, table lamps for a small factory in a contemporary Lugansk in Ukraine, they... Uh, uh, technical limitations for these lamps were quite huge, so there were a few creative things they could design. And then she said that, okay, as a head of a designer's group, she said, we have free time, we have some budget left, let's now each of us design four uh, different table lamps the way you want, without any limitations, without any restrictions, just for ourselves. <laughs> So she did uh, had these four lamps in the end, and they won uh, a silver. So you can see how they want to play with Memphis, how they want to be uh, create emotional design, uh, but also functional. And she won a silver medal of within half the USSR for this uh, set of lamps, Klost, Varan, Epsilon, and Delta. And they never went to the mass production, of course. And this is just another example of a unknown. I call it new waves of a design <laughs> that many people do not imagine existed. And uh, the final uh, question is why I researched the topic of uh, women designers uh, separately. So we just uh, discussed that the whole history of Soviet design is relatively unknown, but the history of women in Soviet design is even more unknown <laughs> part of this uh, history and as a part of a puzzle for me. Uh, when I gave birth to my daughter, I started questioning myself, like, uh, how our world changed? Uh, can I say now that all the professional paths are open to her, or do we still have limitations? And in one way, Soviet design history is a brilliant example, like uh, starting from Futemas, and this is a part of a catalog on Futemas layout uh, that I research on a topic of women in Futemas. And compare, comparing to Bauhaus, uh, we had women on so many uh, traditionally male dominant departments. For example, there were so many uh, women architectures. Um, and even if uh, the percent of graduators from the architect department in Futemas was only 13% uh, of women graduators, um, from what we know so far, Still, it was over 25 students who continued their professional career as architects. And in the world uh, it, uh, back then, there were no such numbers at all. Um, uh, although, for example, as I mentioned, on metal works and wood departments, uh, there were no uh, women graduators. Uh, there were a couple of students who later did uh, furniture and uh, theatrical set design, like uh, Yelena and Simonova, and this is an example of her uh, interior for the Workers' Club proposal. But uh, also I researched the role of uh, women uh, pedagogues at the Futemas, and this is, for example, my research on how Alexandra Exter, Lyubov Popova, and Nadezhda Udaltsova contributed to the development of the discipline of color. And they each had their own contribution in that perspective. And later on, I connect this topic with uh, researchers, uh, women researchers at the Vniete. But my major discovery so far with all the statistics I did from 20s till late 80s, and it, it's a work in progress, so it's not fully published uh, yet. 
um, and they participated in a couple of conference, conferences and given this talk now. What I discovered that in one way, it's a great example of um, how new possibilities um, allowed women to succeed in so many aspects of profession and provide their own uh, view to it, like Galina Zbalashova as the first uh, Soviet architects. And if you are in Europe, um, you can actually now see her works at the Vitra Design Museum exhibition. Here we are uh, now, Women in Design, that I was also worked for as a curatorial advisor on Soviet content. And so she was not only the first uh, woman who uh, became a so-called uh, space interior designer or space architect that she called herself. So she introduced so many innovative things uh, uh, back then. Um, but uh, the whole idea was that in despite of this uh, Soviet propaganda of uh, gender equality that was first guaranteed by the Soviet first Soviet constitution, if you study how this status has changed inside the text of the constitution till the late 80s, uh, women uh, appear to have more and more responsibilities. So it in the end, it doesn't look equal at all. And uh, there was still plenty of uh, so-called glass selling so, uh, that you have to describe uh, numerically, like in which, uh, for some reasons, after the Second World War, uh, it was easier for women to make a technical and engineering career rather than artistic career that was more valued. Mm -hmm. And many of the women that I interviewed, for example, even um, Svetlana Mirzayan, who was designer of the rough car and uh, it was interesting that uh, there is this uh, famous damsels of design project in the united states and uh, they have an advertising and they were originally mostly used using women for decoration of the car to making some of uh, uh, accessories like fo foldable umbrellas and uh, uh, mirrors and stuff and they have a line in the advertisement uh, and maybe one day a woman will be cap capable of designing a whole new car <laughs> and it was the same years when um, UK and also in um, in UK even before but also in uh, USSR uh, Svetlana Mirzayan already designed a couple of cars <laughs> and uh, well, but at the same time when I interviewed her she said that she wanted to become a sculptor but her place was given to a boy and she said like okay metal uh, department is not popular you should go there they have enough hours of sculpture so you can study sculpture but in another department and uh, the same with Tatiana Samoylova when I introduced to uh, interviewed her so you see her first graduation projects and her first projects were quite industrial but she personally always enjoyed doing this tiny stuff like this uh, electronic clocks that I showed in the end she also designed and she said that originally I just came to the department and said where well, the competition is lower. She It was quite late when she decided that she wants to be a designer. And so she had uh, lower drawing skills and she just asked where it is easier to enter the art school. And they told her, okay, go on metal. And so she ended up as being an industrial designer. And that's a kind of a story that I discovered inside. So if in the end it was from uh, our art into industry, the way uh, all constructivist artists did, and including uh, Varvara Stepanov and Lubov Popova, uh, my latest story is about going from industry into the pure art, the way Nadezhda Dvoryanova, for example, did. <laughs> so that's all about I wanted to say, I guess. I think, uh, I think we actually have already one question from uh, actually my dear friend Everardo. Um, uh, but before we take a question, I uh, again I'm stunned uh, and um, I can't believe how mo how much work you were able to do. I mean, you don't have a kind of support. You know, many people have in other countries of grants and so on. And I'm just thinking, you know, like every year, hundreds of books get published about Bauhaus. With the same photographs, you know, if we just took like money for one of these books and gave it to you and your students, like, you know, how many more stories you will be able to tell. But I hope that this talk and other, you know, talks you're doing will alert people and, uh, you know, uh, you'll be able to do more of it in the future. Uh, and the story is absolutely unique. But I don't want to comment. I mean, I have things to say, but let's take uh, Iberardo. So Iberardo is asking, right? Do we know if those artists and designers knew each other at the time? Where are we exchanging ideas? 
who do you mean by those artists? Uh, yeah. I mean, the designers, you know, we all kind of write, I mean, we kind of worked off in the same institutes, uh, you know, at least we knew each other. Um, um, so, I mean, in this, in this talk, we didn't really talk about artists. I mean, you have this underground, right, avant-garde artists, but I don't think we have any connection to design, as far as I know. Uh, so we didn't really talk about artists in the right, so sorry. I, I, I think, um, no. I can answer this question in two ways. First, if we talk about artists and designers inside of Russia, uh, yes, they did uh, collaborate uh, outside of work, or for example, starting from the uh, mid uh, 80s in a center for technical aesthetics in Moscow, there were seminars for designers from various departments. So um, they all could so, experiment there together to just to exchange some creative ideas. Many designers exchanged ideas with international designers on uh, this uh, exit uh, uh, seminars that were organized uh, by Vniete also. Uh, then uh, there was this Senish seminar that also uh, starting from a uh, mid sixties uh, that also combined artists from all the USSR and they came together for this unique, a couple of uh, a month and a half workshops where they could work together. So uh, also it is interesting that while inside of uh, the Institute of Technical Aesthetic uh, starting from a uh, late 60s till uh, late 80s, you cannot use the word design for Soviet design. You were using technical aesthetic for theory and uh, mm, uh, yes. artistic, artistic engineering for practice. Um, the Union of Artists were allowed to do it. So in 1974, there is a book, uh, Artist in Design, by Evgeny Rosenblum published. And in 1977, it's another part of my uh, research, the word, um, for the first exhibition of the young designers, it was officially called so, was organized at the youth section of the Soviet Union of Artists at the U of the USSR. And mm. we, on the exhibition, we show a couple of projects that participated there. So officially, they had a youth, an exhibition of a young designers inside the youth section of the Union of Artists. And so also in this exhibition, many people from various institutions collaborated together just to make something creative. And uh, if we mean uh, collaboration with international designers, that was more complicated. Uh, only a few people could afford it, but still this exchange existed. And of course, it only officially increased after the creation of the Union of Designers of the USSR in 1986. Then they started bringing international designers intentionally in order to introduce them to the uh, local designers. But through uh, publications, they all knew each other. And so uh, I've heard some stories, for example, from graphic designers when we were uh, visiting uh, Valeria Kopov, uh, uh, who was a, one of the head sector, uh, head of the Prom Grafica section, author of many famous uh, Soviet uh, logos. Uh, he told about uh, that Herb Lubalin visited the USSR, for example. And when he saw his uppercase and lowercase, uh, you know, prints reprinted uh, by a co copy machine uh, to be spread it among designers. He was so touched that he sent a whole pack of it uh, to Russia. Also recently there was published an interesting um, a letters uh, from archive of Russian and Stepanova that shows showcase um, a, a letter exchange between uh, Alexander Rochenko and Jan Chichold, for example. And then they, he, he also mentioned that he uh, sent uh, to Rochenko his book and he is happy to receive some Soviet publications. So privately, there is always this exchange as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think especially in the painters, uh, right? I mean, we brought, you know, the Soviet Union didn't become this closed space here, so, right? There was no Iron Curtain, you know, and uh, the Bauhaus and Hutima's faculty were, you know, writing uh, to each other, right? Exchanging ideas. I mean, the, the Western architects like Rubizier and others were participating in architecture exhibitions in Russia, but that's a whole other story. So I know that your time is limited because you have another event at two o'clock, and uh, so far we only had uh, one, you know, one question, and uh, I don't dare, right? I don't dare to take any more, any more time. I hope that my interruptions were not too disturbing, but uh, partly so was just, informative. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, uh, but maybe I'll just mention one more thing, which is also relevant. So we didn't talk about arts, right? Visual arts or cinema, which is also a whole other story and just as the kind of history this hidden history of russian design is now being reconstructed kind of before your eyes uh and alone is really you know in the avant-garde right the avant-garde of 
design reconstruction, something similar happening to the history of cinema, history of visual arts. For example, just recently, I saw uh, a very interesting publication in Russian about all the films which were kind of made, but when banned in Soviet Union, never shown, I thought it was dozens of films, it turned out it was hundreds of films. And as far as visual arts, um, recently me and my research assistant did a publication. It's available on my website. It's all free. Uh, based on the exhibition I saw in Moscow in 2019 about the very first Museum of Modern Art, which was not MoMA, as everybody thinks, but it was a Museum of Painterly Culture, or Pictorial Culture, also established in 1919. It was run by all avant-garde artists, you know, Rochenka, Tatlin, kind of the same characters. It was closed in 1929. And uh, in, in the late 20s, Alfred Barr visited Moscow and he saw the Institute. And a few years later, he started the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, like, I don't want to say that he completely got all his ideas from his visit, but he probably got some ideas. Uh, and again, uh, until two years ago, I didn't know that the very first Museum of Modern Art didn't, was not MoMA but kind of was, uh, was, was the museum which started in Russia 10 years earlier. And I'm hoping, uh, this is my hope, this is my dream, that within my lifetime, the history of 20th century culture would be largely rewritten and uh, the contributions of all the people who lived in so-called communist countries uh, they would be recognized. And, uh, you know, uh, the Bauhaus will become like a smaller planet in this history and Hutimas will become a much bigger planet. Uh, but, you know, this process is just the beginning, right? Like, if you look at the history of engineering, if you look at the history of computers, uh, not only contributions of Russians, but also contributions of Europeans were neglected, right? So the history is really dominated by America. So, for example, when you go to Wikipedia and you read about history of computers, you don't read what's happening, what was happening in France, Japan, and so on. So I think your work is, a, is a, in the avant-garde of a large, larger movement, which is to rethink, right, rewrite uh, cultural history, which the one we have now is completely product of Cold War, right, where uh, basically America occupies the proportionally larger space because also all these people immigrated to America, right, from Bauhaus, from Europe in the 30s, and, uh, you know, America is very good for PR, and that's why Bauhaus became famous, so I hope that within the next 20 years we'll get much, much more balanced um, you know, history, and uh, again, your, I think your courage, your curiosity, your, uh, I think, ability just to go, like, right, keep digging, uh, and also talking to those people who are still alive is unbelievable. I hope it will inspire, you know, people who watch us to do their own digging projects and not only, you know, follow what, like, you know, what, what you know, Zuckerberg, right, or Bill Gates said, uh, uh, Etc. Because we really don't want to live in. I mean, I know about you, but I really don't want to live in a uh, metaverse, unless unless it has all these designs from Russian avant-garde design history, right? Uh, but you know, I don't think we'll get. You know, usually when you go to these virtual spaces, it's extremely uh, so alert from calendar. Feminist oh. research methodologies and. Nice, yeah. So uh, anyway, I think, uh, well, anyway, you can know what I was going to say. I think that's enough. And Alona, maybe just, you know, uh, I mean, I don't see like, right, more questions. Uh, you probably have to go in a few minutes, uh, but if you have still a few minutes, you can say anything you want to say. Uh, you know, any, you can tell us anecdote, whatever you like. Thank you very much, Lev, for this uh, very inspiring conclusion. And uh, it is true that we're actually <laughs> fundraising uh, money now for a, an exhibition catalog, and we want to turn it into a bigger history of the um, material um, objects in uh, Russia. So um, it's a mixture of uh, Russian art and uh, design um, that was uh, that uh, one way or another took the form of uh, material objects, because uh, as I've started with uh, Karl Kantor's idea of projectivity of Russian culture, and as he stated for it, uh, unreleased projects are sometimes even uh, more or at least no less important than uh, non-realized ones. And uh, so uh, Russian design is not famous with an up particular applications of design, like we don't have an iconic Russian design chair, for example. There were so uh, many uh, local um, success successes connected with, for example, heavy industry, military sector, space design. So the uh, 
Uh, sort of thing. What's well, famous is the Kalashnikov, and what's famous is T-34, right? So basically, and, and maybe the third thing, which is famous, of course, Tatlin, Tatlin, like a uh, Tatlin Tower, right? Yeah, so, so Tower is an utopia, and Rasputin is a it's for propaganda for war, right? So, yeah. it's, so what you're showing us is a complete revelation. Yeah, but uh, also inside the exhibition, we show some of this uh, pieces like uh, high quality Zenit photo camera, horizon photo camera, or Sputnik inspired uh, uh, samovar. <laughs> Uh, uh, some uh, 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 clocks uh, done in Chlebin's Monia factory where until now they're doing all the plain clocks and watches. Uh, so uh, we have uh, some uh, particular trait in designing uh, uh, very um, long lasting uh, technical goods, but in terms of uh, everyday comfort and uh, uh, material culture was quite different, although we had also this trace in the uh, development of DIY culture and DIY approaches. And even on the contemporary exhibition, we show works of contemporary designers like uh, Vadim Kibardin, who just like Soviet designers, not simply did a cardboard stool, but he proposed um, um, uh, inst an inst a DIY instruction following which each person can do this tool for himself. So this uh, culture of makers is now taking a new um, level of development in contemporary Russia. It could also be traced to our rich uh, Soviet history of DIY practices. That's another aspect to be studied. So we have this. This, this, but, is, a, yeah, this, is, a, this is a whole of history. I mean, we can know, right? We know a lot about DIY practices in places like Africa, or Cuba. But what people don't realize is that. Like all these designs existed, but when, when you go to a store, you couldn't buy it because we didn't produce enough, it was bad quality. And this whole history of kind of DUI engineering, DUI design, DUI culture, right? Uh, or maybe reaching up to some of that still also needs to be told, right? So that's a whole other inspiration. And of course, this idea of DUI, right, is becoming more and more relevant. Uh, so as opposed to buying things, you know, and then, you know, we uh, destroying nature, right? Because these things were shipped from China to IKEA in your country, you know, right? Supposedly we can get with 3D model, 3D, you know, designs and print things ourselves. What maybe we could just simply go to a forest and just you know, build some things, you know, from some, you know, all three. Um, and uh, I personally never thought about this Russian DIY culture until you mentioned it. So it's a whole other, it's a whole other universe you have to take us as, you have to fly to one day. Yeah, so we have avant-garde, just in, in uh, as a short resume, we have avant-garde that still ha ha has a lot of to, stories to be told and discovered. We have uh, a whole uh, set of these futuristic uh, design uh, proposals from Nieta. Uh, we have this DIY culture and um, Soviet art design, as a few examples that I uh, showed you. And these all are just tops of the iceberg, among other aspects that really interest me this gender dimension of uh, Soviet design that has many narratives uh, inside of it. Then it is um, more, the whole model of the USSR is a multinational republic uh, structure uh, that was in, in terms of NATO commanded from the center, but then it has a local application of this unified uh, uh, programs uh, from the center. And I've already started my research on uh, uh, the Soviet design in national republics. Uh, so they now in terms, uh, you know, for example, in Georgia, there was a Georgian Futemas, then there was a Georgian uh, section of, uh, of Nieta, and so many interesting uh, furniture projects uh, combined with uh, local tradition of uh, wood uh, works and metal works and it is so interesting to study. I believe uh, that um, it, this research is equally important for these um, uh, contemporary countries that are now trying to rebuild their own history as a whole, but also in order to view Soviet culture, not as something that was totally unified and placed only in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Or that's right. That. But, but that's right. It was a whole empire, basically, right? And now we have you know, 15, I think, or 16 separate countries. And um, and if, you know, if, if like, we, if what was happening in Moscow was kind of forgotten on purpose, what was happening in the other places was forgotten even more. And I just want to end, last thing I want to say, many people don't realize to what extent it is not easy to reconstruct this history because, you know, when the Stalin started to pay attention to culture in the even early 30s, you know, uh, this history was kind of erased. So I, uh, in 76, in 70, 70, 79, 
uh, right, as a young person in Moscow. I was a student in the Moscow Architecture Institute with famous Marquis. And only this year, I finally realized with the building of our institute was the same building where Futimas was. So when I was studying there, right, in the late seventies, the memory of Futimas was so erased that none of our faculty told me, right, nobody knew about it in the whole institute, right? So what happened about 30 years ago, even though we used this rationalist textbook, which was written by Kerensky, right, the colleague of Ladovsky. Uh, and uh, when I started writing about new media and kind of connecting it to the Reverter, Felicitsky in the 1990s, I, that, that's all I knew. That's what everybody knew, right? So we also live in a very exciting moment when uh, there's this energy, right? Creative energy to bring back this history and to connect it to, to the present, the future, and the future to the future. So I already told Alena that I'm willing to help her in any way she wants. Maybe I can help with fundraising, data visualization, just to be her assistant, because I find the stuff to be so incredibly inspiring. Nothing inspires me more. And um, uh, I think maybe we'll, after the end, you know, we'll also put some information how people can get in touch with you uh, under the YouTube translation. And uh, you know, maybe, I don't know if you're using Kickstarter to do fundraising, but today I was looking at Kickstarter. And you know what? 40% 30, 30 of our projects successfully get refunding where. So apparently it may be not as hard as we think, although I don't know how many people on Kickstarter will be interested in this story. Uh, so maybe we'll have to say actually what we're actually looking at is, is building some Soviet supercomputer from the 30s. Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, it's very, very important, right? And it's very important to do it now while some of people are still alive and you can interview them. So thank you yeah, again. Uh, that's uh, another con concluding issue that uh, first many of the things were destroyed uh, uh, after the 20s, but then also during the 90s. Um, th th then we had a Second World War. Uh, that was another problem <laughs> in terms of uh, keeping archives and uh, finding the proper information. But then during the 90s, it was sometimes even worse because uh, after... Yeah, the, the, 90s Ecola, was, the 90s was the most tragic decade in Russian cultural history. Because the way all the places lost funding, people lost kind of their status, and you know, uh, what was it wild capitalism? In a way, things were destroyed, right? More, more things were destroyed in the 90s when during the, during the Stalin time. That's, that's the irony. Yes, because people started giving places for rent, spaces for rent, and they just threw away the archives to get rid of uh, them and to free some uh, place. And nowadays, while there are still some people alive, it is so important to talk to them. So if you know somebody, please interview them. <laughs> thank you very much, Lev. And I'll really thank all of our listeners. Um, and so we'll be happy to answer questions. If you have some more later, just feel free to write under this translation. And, yeah, and, and the, video, video, the video will remain, right, on the side. Yeah, the video and, will remain, and you can I'll write down the commentaries. In a couple of weeks, again, to remind people about this link. And uh, I hope, you know, you'll, if you find this interesting, please tell your friends, your students, your colleagues to watch it. Uh, because I think this is really, it's not something you'll find anywhere on YouTube. I can guarantee it, right? So you're really in the presence of something, I think, some like amazing. It's like, you know, uh, basically we're like in the spatial Valona. And she's really taking us to a different civilization. And it's almost like for the first time we're meeting our cultural aliens, which is this other civilization uh, of creativity, uh, which exists in the Soviet Union and now is completely forgotten. So thank you, Aliona, for being our uh, space captain. Thank you very much, Lev. And now I think we found a proper ending. So please share and like our video. <laughs> and have a great day.